as we welcome in James. Sam, James, you were just in time for Kenny to say bad things about uh, Evan Mobley and 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 Scotty. Barnes. My guys, Evan Mobley. And That's not true. Though I think I think that was the nicest things you've said in succession about those those two guys. Those are my guys, man. Those I would take guys. both of them over Edwards. If I'm starting a franchise, no question asked. You can find scores. You can find scores every day of the week. There's only a handful of guys like that. You would start a franchise with those because you know you're going to have to go get a score. Well, yeah, but you can average 22. Those three are on the board. You're drafting Anthony Edwards last. Yeah. Oh, James. Yeah. Oh, not not even. Yeah, I'm taking Mobley. Uh, and I'm taking Scotty Barnes. I, I mean, look, like the point is to win, and the point is to build. Like those guys you're talking about, they're they're unicorns. Like shooting guards grow on trees, but those other guys, those are yeah. difficult positions and players, uh, like player types to fill. And yeah. I think not, they're game changers. Not shooting guards that can lead the league in scoring. They do not grow on trees. Well, last time I checked, I he's not leading the league in scoring yet. I was doing is projecting because Scotty Barnes and and Evan Mobley, they're not defensive players of the year. They haven't uh they they haven't been the best. So we're only projecting. So just like people project about Evan Mobley and Scotty Barnes and what they're gonna be, it's fair to project that Anthony Edwards could one day lead the league in scoring. So if that's who he is, they do not grow on trees. Well, I don't even care if he leads the league in scoring. I want to. I, 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 I want to win. I want to win games. And if I'm starting a franchise, I'm going with two players that I believe help you win games. And Jay, those, Anthony those Edwards players. is the, the top best scores in the league. Those are the best I, players in the game. I, I like Anthony Edwards. I, that's nothing against him. I'm just telling you, if I was starting a team, I'd take the other two. Is Anthony Edwards the best player on the Minnesota Timberwolves? He might be. Like, I mean, it's a coin flip between him and Cat. Okay, I'd still give it to Cat right now. Right now, today, mm. yeah, I, I think, think Anthony think Edwards is the difference maker. Like, I think he's the heart and soul of that team, mm-hmm. which is why when he's an idiot, it's really, really disappointing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, he's he's immature and he's very young, and, and not just young as far as like, like. You know, there are some guys that come into the league, like Keegan Murray is super, super mature for a 22-year-old. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think Anthony Edwards, like, he, ha- he doesn't have a lot of life experience, and you're going to make mistakes. And, I, I-, I mean, I- I'm not, like, saying it's okay what he said and what he did, um, but at the same time, you have to remember that these are, like, 20, 21-year-old guys that, you know, and again, a guy like him, has he ever had like any of the fame and fortune, the answer is no. Like this is all new to him, and sure, he said things that he should not have said, and and that's not okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I, I think sometimes we forget that these are these are kids. Well, I are, don't care how old you are. How other people live their life is none of your goddamn business. Mm-hmm. No, I, that's how I, I feel about it. I agree with you on that, but like it's not your place to comment on them and put them on your instagram story or whatever social profile it was like yeah and and i get i I get your point of being young but that's that i I don't care how old you are like out of pocket man completely that's that's that's, that's, yeah let's let's stay with let's 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 stay with defense here for a minute if if this season let's frame it like this bigger impact on on this season for the kings Media day coming up just a few days from now. Defense or De'Aaron? Mm. If I picked one and said, James, one of these two things will go exactly the way you want. Defense or De'Aaron? Which one would you say, okay, I want this one because this is going to result in the season we want for the Kings? Yeah, it's, I, I think it's De'Aaron. And mm-hmm. I would like to say defense, but at the same time, like, look, like improving this thing is going to – is going to be really difficult, like in the yeah. short term, long term. Yeah. But I think if De'Aaron Fox comes out and is the player that everyone thinks that he is uh, in Sacramento, but clearly people around the country don't believe, um, then I think that he's going to, uh, he's going to be able to lead this team somewhere. And, you know, the defense, he's got to be better defensively. That's part of it. Um, but uh, if he comes out and he's the, 
the force that he shows in bursts, these six to eight week bursts that we've seen throughout his career, and he can sustain that the entire season, this is a good team. I swear we don't do this on purpose, but I, I was my first thought was defense to Damien's question. And mm-hmm. this is why I would say it, because the Aaron Fox didn't play the way we would have won him to last year. So like by that scenario, like if 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 the defense plays the way you want it to, or De'Aaron Fox plays the way you want him to, which one would you take? Well, we've seen De'Aaron Fox not play exactly the way we want him to, and he'd still be a good ball player. He's he'd still be a guy that averages 23 and six or whatever the case may be. If we want him to do more than that, and he falls short of that and averages 24 and five, that's still good if you get like a defense that is middle of the pack in the league. Like if you if if I got the defense that was 15th in the league and you got a De'Aaron that averages 24 and 6, I think you're winning. I think you're good. But if you get like um De'Aaron averaging 27 and the defense is still 25th in the league, I don't I don't know if you can get to where you're trying to get. Yeah, for me, I don't really care about the scoring number. What I care about is, does he lead his team to victory? And and I mean, it goes back to the other argument that we were having before about uh, about Anthony Edwards and and Mobley and Scotty Barnes. Like, just win. Like, give me a player that's a winning player. And Fox is like throughout his career, he has bursts where he's a winning player, and he has other bursts where that that doesn't seem to be like like overall with the team, not him in particular, but. Like winning doesn't seem to really be the focus. I, mm. I, I don't care what his numbers are. Lead your team to victory, and if he can get this team to the playoffs, I, I think that that you know if he can be the leader and you know the guy who steps on the court and is the best player, that's where like I think he can have a bigger impact because the defense again it's that's a it's a team thing and they'll get better periodically throughout the season and like that they'll continue to grow um, under under Mike Brown, but. Like Fox has a potential to to carry a franchise, and he needs to show that. James, we were talking uh, a few minutes ago about Rashawn Holmes and what his potential impact could be on this season if he's you know locked in and focused and kind of embraces this role. And shout out to Bryant West of the Kings Herald who wrote a, a you know a great piece on this. Uh, but Will Z proposed a, a, an, an interesting question. I'm I'm going to reframe it a little bit. I'll give you Will Z's question, and, and and of course it lacks a little bit of context given our conversation. But he said, if the Kings make the playoffs, could Rashawn win Six Man of the Year? And I'm I'm going to rephrase the question a little bit and say, could Rashawn Holmes be the best player off the bench for the Sacramento Kings? Yeah, I mean, I, I think he can be like super impactful off the bench. Um, I, I also think that there's there's a possibility that he starts like. Like, not that that's where I would go, but I still think there's a possibility he starts alongside Sabonis. The Sean Cunningham conspiracy theory. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Sean had conversations with people. That's not like something that Sean pulled out uh, out of his own, you know, bag of tricks there. He had conversations, and that's part of the conversation that, that's going on behind the scenes. Like, who's going to start for this team? How long do you wait to, to go to Keegan Murray? Do you start Keegan Murray from day one, which is what I would do? Um, but again, I, I don't technically have a win loss record and these guys do, so they're going to mm-hmm. do what they think helps win games, you know, the earliest and, and then grow from there. Um, but I, I think Rashawn Holmes is like incredibly important to this team because if you look at the way that Mike Brown and the Golden State Warriors kind of handled their business last year, it was with, uh, you know, like Looney and, and Draymond, like, it's kind of like that undersized, versatile big man that goes around and does a bunch of stuff. And it's not so much with a guy like Sabonis. And on the defensive end, like, there was a point two years ago where Rashawn Holmes was an excellent defender. I don't know, like, his whole entire season last year, you just want to crumple up and throw it away. Mm-hmm. Like, he came in with the wrong attitude. You could tell right away that he wasn't happy about the contract that he got. Like, it was very apparent that he was not okay with the contract that he got, which again, that's on his agent. That's not on the Kings. The Kings did what they could and somehow he signed there. Um, but then, you know, you had the two scratched eye eyeball situations, the lacerated, uh, 
eyeball situation. Uh, then you had the COVID stuff. And all the time, well, we had no idea what was going on. He was also embroiled in this crazy custody battle that was going on the entire season. So, like, look, sometimes, you know, life comes at you fast. I mean, look at what's happening with Tom Brady and, and how he's trying to handle, you know, real life at the same time while trying to be a teammate and, and trying to, you know, lead a franchise and, and all this stuff. I, I mean, Rashawn Holmes had a ton of stuff going on. Yeah. And it just didn't lead to like the proper environment for him to find success. Now, I, like we didn't even mention that midseason. Oh, by the way, you lost your job. They traded for a two-time All Star. It's twenty-five years old, and your job is now gone. I mean, that's a rough season to go through for anyone. And I, I think that like he can have a redemption season. He can get right back to being the like twelve points, eight rebounds, almost two blocks per game, you know, one point six blocks is what he had a couple of years ago. Um, that's something if he can get back to that, the Kings are a better team. Mm -hmm. It's just how do you piece it all together? How do you work him and Sabonis in the lineup at the same time? Can they coexist? That it's gonna be very difficult to figure all these things out. I think those two can coexist for a short stance. I don't think that they can coexist with De'Aaron Fox. So you can't have all three of them because you can't have three non-shooters on the court unless one or two of them decide that they're going to be shooters this season. And so, yeah, I think it's going to be interesting. Mike Brown has a really, really hard job in front of him just trying to figure out how these pieces fit together. Well, one of the things that Mike Brown is going to have to do, in my opinion, James, is he's going to have to, and this may be a hard sell or it may be you know easy to do, but he's going to have to sell guys like Rashawn Holmes and maybe Malik Monk and, and all these other guys on the concept of the team, the team, the team, the team. Rashawn, would you like to play 30 minutes a night or 25 minutes a night or whatever the case may be? Uh, absolutely. Get a bunch of touches, all this other stuff. That may not be your role this year. It may be 22 minutes a night, but I need you to be locked in for those 22 minutes and give me the best 22 minutes that you can give me every night. And when it comes to six minutes to go in the fourth quarter, you're probably, you might come out. You're probably going to come out, but I, I need you to be okay with that. I need you to understand it's about the team. And I don't say like it's a difficult job because these are selfish guys or nothing like that, but they're competitive. They want to play, you know, they want to play as much as possible. And Mike Brown's job is going to be, in my opinion, to sell all these guys on buying into a role and buying into the team, no matter what that may look like. Yeah, it's kind of what I wrote about this weekend in Sunday Musings. It's that like this this entire group of players is basically twenty four to twenty six, with two two slight outliers and in, in Holmes, which is twenty eight, and Barnes is thirty. So if you're looking at the rotation, it really is a whole bunch of twenty four year olds. Like, uh, what do they have? One, two, three, four, four 24 year olds, a, a 30 year old, a 28 year old, but a 22 year old and a 26 year old. You got a whole bunch of guys who actually understand who they are and what they are as players. And, and that's pretty good. It's good that they're walking into the season and sure you want to have to find roles and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, like these guys come in with an understanding of what their role should be. They just need to be who they were and other stops. Now, they might need to be better at that. Uh, you know, Kevin Herter might have to take an additional three three-pointers a game and hit like, you know, you know, 1.2 extra three points three-pointers a game, but that still you're not going to ask him to do something that he hasn't done. And so, again, like we go back to De'Aaron Fox's first season 2017, um he was one of five rookies on the team. You know, Justin Jackson, uh, Frank Mason, Harry Giles, uh, Bogdan Bogdanovich. But he also, the year before, they had drafted Papa Giannis, they had drafted Malachi Richardson, they had drafted Scalabi Sierra, and then midseason they traded for Buddy Hield. So they had four rookies from the previous year. So you walk into that rookie season with De'Aaron Fox, nine first year and second year players. That's just, that's no way to win. There's no way to win in that situation. And it doesn't matter how much positivity or how good your coach is or anything else. There's just too many players with without like defined roles and defined understanding of who they're going to be at the next level. Now we get to, you know, this season 
And almost everyone is on a second NBA contract or a third NBA contract. And the two guys that, that you really have to worry about, you don't have to worry about. It's Keegan Murray and it's Davion Mitchell. Those two are going to be in the rotation, but they're also very mature. I mean, Davion Mitchell, he's in the group of 24 24 year old players. Like he's 24 years old. He's the same age as De'Aaron Fox, Malik Monk, Kevin Herter. And so these guys, Mm -hmm. yeah, they understand who, what they are. And and if you wonder if Davion knows what he is, Davion knows exactly who he is as an NBA player. And it it didn't take him long to figure it out. Keegan Murray is not going to take him long to figure out exactly who he is. Now, can he get better as time goes on? Sure. But that doesn't mean he doesn't know walking in the door like how he can help a team. He's that kind of player. And so I think that that's going to be maybe one of the biggest things for this season where you almost don't even have to have like this rah-rah leader. Everyone knows they're, what, what they're there to do because they're not being asked to do anything that they haven't done in the past. Yeah, we were talking about how this, you know, we, we always look for leadership and these, these, you know, the spark and, you know, those intangibles. It feels like this year with this roster, this coach, this group, it simply boils down to talent. Like that's what's going to tell the story of the season. Is the team talented enough to make it or not? Yeah. No, I mean, I think that there's that's... no bad seeds. There's no bad yeah. apples. There's no one who doesn't want to be here. Like, it's none of that anymore. You, you you just did the age thing and like you've got mature guys here. You've it's it's all in place. The question is, are they good enough? Yeah, I mean, and you can say like you've even got the coach in place and a new coach mm-hmm. that has this winning track record. He's coming in positivity like this is a put up or shut up moment for a good group of players here, like a bunch of players, like a Rashawn Holmes, like a De'Aaron Fox, like a Harrison Barnes, like been here a long time and we get it. Things haven't gone well, but look around you. Like the only people that might be the same is like Miguel, the locker room attendant. That Mm -hmm. might be the only person that's the same. So that you've dealt with your entire career in Sacramento. So like move forward, figure out a way to, to forget the past live in the present, live with the, in the present with a group of players that have like none of the baggage that you have in Sacramento and, and try to do something that hasn't been done in 16 years. This is um, cause, cause hearing you guys talk about like, you know, and you guys are both right. Like put up or shut up. Like gotta get, gotta get something done. How long of a leash do you think Monty McNair gives this group? And what I mean by that is if it's a slow start, you see him pulling the trigger, on you know a trade to to shake things up or does he wait kind of how he did last year a little bit you know how how quick will he be to be like we're not doing this again this year and make a move for somebody or, or trade something like that yeah when i'm looking at monty mcnair he's just waiting for the right dance partner it doesn't matter what the record is it doesn't matter where they're heading he's waiting for the right dance partner if that dance partner steps forward he's ready to go like it, this is not about what we're, we need to do is we need to take out that question that Damien asked. Are they good enough? He needs to remove that as one of the key questions. If you can do that by making the right trade and all of a sudden everyone understands that the talent is good enough, just what are you going to do with it? Mm-hmm. Then that that's a different story. That's where like right now I have the Kings anywhere between six and 11 right? In, in the Western conference, they could go all the way down to 11. And if everything went right, they can get all the way up to six. If you could make a deal that made this team a four, five, six, and not worry about seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, then you do it. And it doesn't matter if you take a short term step backwards to take a monstrous step forward, you have to do it. And I think that that's, that's one of the reasons why I, I push for what I believe is the right thing. And that is the Kings to extend Monty McNair, because you have to give him that opportunity to do what's best for, again, the next two, three, four, five years, not what's best for him today to keep his job going into next season. And, and that's, it's a big deal. Like right now, no, they don't, they don't have the talent for me to tell you that they're going to make the playoffs. They have enough talent that I think that they can, but there's no surefire thing. And, if there's a deal out there that pops up that makes them a surefire thing, I guarantee you Monty McNair will jump on it. 
Re- real quick, Dave, do you, but do you think that Monty, even without the extension, and I agree with you, like sign him to the extension and get some security in here, but do you think that he's already done that without the extension? I mean, he, he's not thinking about, um, you know, worrying about uh, the wrong trading the draft picks away or anything like that to get Kevin Herter or sign sign Malik Monk or signing, uh, excuse me, trading Tyrese Halliburton away. Like he's doing what's best to get them over the hump without any apprehension. You think he's already doing that as is, or do you think that with a, a contract extension, there's more he could do with that type of security? Yeah, I just don't want that to be a part of the equation. I think, like, I understand what you're saying, and I do think Monty McNair has done what's right to this to this point, or at least what he thinks is right, whether it works out that way or not. It's in the moment. It's what he thought was the right move, and it was the right move for today, tomorrow, five years from now, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe not five years from now, because the right move in the moment five years from now might have been Tyrese Halliburton. We won't know until we get there. Um, but, yeah, I think that Monty is a guy who... Um, like has pure motives and and that's something that like is a rarity in Sacramento, like a guy with his motives are to make this team better. And it's not about ego. It's not about anything else. It's about making this team better. And I mean, he has rolled the dice a couple of times. He he's been conservative when he had to be conservative. He's been conservative when he probably shouldn't have been. Um, but then when it came to like taking a big swing, he showed no fear. And, you know, he knew that there would be a backlash. He knew maybe not as much from the national media as it has been. Um, but, you know, how is it the national media all of a sudden a bunch of guys are saying, hey, this Kings team could be pretty good this year. Well, they haven't said that in five years. And these are the same. Some of them are the same guys that trashed Monty McNair for for the trade uh, that happened in February. So, yeah, I, I think it's. Again, he's a guy who has pure motives. He he wants to do what's best for the franchise and for the city and everything else, and and that's the the best you can hope for. You think there's any chance he leaves, like on his own, like waits this out and just like no, I, I up my value, I fix this team, I'm out of here. Sure, like why not? Like if a job comes along that's a better job. Like just because you built something and you've got the framework of something, I think he's already proven that that he can draft really, really well. Uh, that he's got like a, a clear cut plan. That he's able to like tighten up a ship that was leaking all over the place for <clears> the <throat> previous five years. All of a sudden, you know, this is a really tight ship that you know a lot of information doesn't slip out. Like we don't <laughs> up until like the day before the draft we. No one kind of figured out who they might take, but but really a lot of that was outside conjecture. So yeah, I mean, I think if he's looking around and the Kings' uh, situation hasn't improved and that they still want to lowball and and keep him at a certain rate and all that stuff, and someone comes along and says, "Hey, we'll give you a five year deal at this amount," why would he not? I mean, this is it's about loyalty, but at the same time, like, where's the loyalty? You know? But if they improve, they can't low. They they can't do that. Like they'd have to. They couldn't lowball him if this team actually is better. You think? But oh, well, you're right. I don't know, man. I, we're in a a situation where, uh, you know, a guy is in the bottom the bottom level of NBA executives, and mm-hmm. and even that. I mean, you can t- look at how many guys have left that they haven't replaced. So even his front office has gone from, you know, like seven or eight guys to like down to a very small group. You know, there's no more George, Joe Dumars. There's no more Ken Catanella. They didn't replace those guys. So mm-hmm. like he's doing more with less. And Well, and, Joe wasn't his front office though, was he? He was oh, he's part a of shadowy the, figure. Yeah, he's part of the division, the decision-making process though. He's in the room. Yeah. Well, they got Vlade now. Like Vlade, I think Vlade's still getting paid. You can, can you check in with him on some decisions. He's around all the time. And like, I think Tyrone Corbin's still getting paid somewhere out there. <laughs> oh man, I, I don't know, man. <laughs> just consult. Just have one big hey, look, guys. We're paying all of you. You're gonna have to come to work this year. We've <laughs> well, got now, some. They they didn't replace him, so to speak. But isn't that kind of what Alvin's doing now? 
Um, yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I, I don't think that I think that Alvin is kind of the bridge between players and general manager. He's he's uh, not on the the same triangle that we were looking at before. So we always had this weird triangle where Vivek's on the top, Joe Dumars is on one side, and Monty McNair is on the other, mm-hmm. and everyone talks to uh, Vivek as opposed to going around Vivek. He's the guy that's in the middle. Um, I think now, like, it's pretty clear that, that Alvin Gentry is, is part of the team, but he's below, he's in the Monty McNair, like, region. He's, he's, uh, below him as far as, like, if you were looking at, like, a, a chart of how, like, if he wanted some PTO, he's got to go to Monty McNair. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that that's the, he doesn't, I, at least not that I know of, like he doesn't like go and directly speak to Vivek Ranadive all the time and, mm-hmm. and sit there and, and have these big powwows where they're trying to help uh, trying to figure out their own path forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, that doesn't feel like what he, he's more of an advisor. He's there to help Mike Brown. He's there to help players who might need, uh, you know, talking to, he's there to, uh, to be part of the support staff and, and he's there to, you know, give Monty McNair and Wes Wilcox, like, uh, an idea of, you know, what he thinks, like, right. this is what I would do. And, you know, even as an offensive advisor, I think he'll be in there, you know, giving some, his thoughts, uh, when it comes to, you know, being creative and, and pushing the envelope because Mike Brown is, is usually conservative on the offensive end. Well, we kind of joke about, um, about Alvin's role and him having to stay cause he still has time on the, on his contract and stuff. But I, I could he's see just a, serving out in his sentence. That's all he's doing, <laughs> serving out his sentence. I could see a scenario, especially given where Alvin's at in his career and his age and stuff like that, where if there is no hard feelings, and you might know a little better than I would, James, I could see him this being a role for him moving forward. This not situation where, oh, you got one year on your deal, so be an advisory just to play it out. Be here for two, three years and 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 have this role. I feel I obviously haven't talked to Alvin Gentry, but I feel like that's a, a role that maybe he he may be okay with um, at this point in time being in the NBA. Yeah, I mean, I think Alvin definitely, he's at that, that point where, you know, it's really tough to keep throwing your name in the hat and trying to get one of these big jobs. Uh, what, 67, six, uh, 66, 67 years old, mm-hmm. um, you know, and that's starting over. It's starting over a new city. It's starting over completely. And uh, if you're comfortable and you understand that you can make a difference still uh, and you're not just some weird, you know, title that's out in space, I think we'll see him a lot. Uh, we'll, we'll see him a lot around the team. And that's a good thing. Like mm-hmm. he has a wealth of knowledge, 30 plus years in the league and he's played, he's had all kinds of different roles. It's good to have one of those guys around. Um, and I, I don't think there's a single player that disliked Alvin Gentry. Um, like, did they agree with all of his coaching decisions and stuff like that? I'm sure that there are people that, that didn't, but that doesn't mean that like everyone likes Alvin Gentry. He's well respected. He's well liked with within the organization, but also around the league. Uh, there's more Kings basketball. Uh, we want to talk about. I gotta admit though, I popped for Allison's YouTube message. She said Buddy Heald is still looking for a trade out of Sacramento. <laughs> for those who have been paying attention, that, that'll never not be funny. Uh, shout out to our guy, Avery Johnson. Because we okay. all know that he doesn't want to be in Sacramento any longer. Said that twice. <laughs> after The little general. After Buddy was in Indiana. We'll come back. We'll talk more Kings basketball. We'll talk more with the creator of the Kings beat. We'll talk more with our ESPN 1320 Kings insider, James Ham, here on Sacramento Sports Leader, ESPN 1320. Did you see, uh, Hammer? You, 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 you can see Jesse's studio now. Boom. There he is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah, it's making a weird noise. I don't oh, know what yeah. that was all about. Oh, but. Yikes! But I got maybe maybe when we're I, I I'm not sure why it doesn't matter. But there's our studio. That looks nice. Yeah. Well, that's not our studio. That's Jesse's studio. Oh, that's the studio within the studio. Yeah, that's all right. You're, we're we're never gonna see our studio, but Jesse's got his. Nice. Um, I'll have if you want that mic flag. I'll have it. Um. 
put into that studio if you want to pick it up on your way to the Golden One Center on Monday, if that's easiest for you. Uh, I, well, I'll, we'll talk about it after the show. Okay. I still don't know what the plan is for that day. Okay. Um, Have you talked to anybody or no? I got a text, but it was just a... Vague. <laughs> yeah, like, hey, checking out a couple of things. Just wanted to, you know, let you know I haven't forgot. We'll, you know, we'll Okay, talk. got it. Got it. So, yeah, that's that's the last thing I got. And that was, I think that actually was yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, we were discussing the Anthony Edwards thing. Like, I hate what he said and all that stuff. Like, I, I thought it was just completely, I totally agree with you. There's never a place and... And it's horrible that, you know, he got caught on camera doing that. But also as someone who's coached a bunch of kids or, you know, 13, 14, 15 year olds for years, like they're what they see on social media, what, you know, how many people around them like post crazy stuff. Like, I think that there is like, like there's a learning curve that I think he just learned uh, big time. And I, you know, it, it took him getting smacked down to, to learn that, but it's also possible that he really hasn't had someone in his ear giving him that learning curve because a lot of the time what I've seen with him is that everyone thinks it like his naivety is funny. Like, Hmm. you know, when we had the, the thing with the, is it Jim Conklin from, uh, from Ireland, right? The guy who, literally you can hardly understand anything that he says he's from nba ireland and he's a super nice guy uh asks questions and you know him and anthony edwards like go back and forth and uh, like i think everyone played that up oh man he's so funny he's so funny and I, I just think that like you're missing the fact that he does not have a huge amount of life experience he is a very young man but also like an immature young man who has shown in the past like his immaturity. And again, I don't want to have that be like an excuse for him, but at the same mm-hmm. time, like it's a reality. Like there no, are I certain things that he just doesn't, he's not going to understand because he hasn't had the, you know, the same type of upbringing that, 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 you know, certain other players have. So. It just frustrates me that people still think they need to comment on other people's life choices. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, That's what drives me nuts. Yeah, I'm with you. Hey, Damien, I uh, just saw a tweet from Jonathan Gavoni. Uh-oh. Fun afternoon watching Donda Academy practice outside L.A. Head coach Darrell Wright has a super long athletic team with arguably – the most talented backcourt in the country in Rod Dillingham and A.J. Johnson. Not sure if they're going to be able to be high school graduates. but Darrell, Jesse just said, uh, I got Darrell's number. Jesse, we can't talk to him about Donda Academy. He had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. I'm dead serious. We learned this, we learned this last night in the middle of our uh, Corners of the Culture podcast recording. Everyone who works at uh, Donda Academy has to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, we had the discussion with Pete Youngman and, you know, part of the parameters talking to Pete was that we weren't going to talk about specifics of the Ignite. He's, that's not his place. And he knows that. So he doesn't have any problems with that, even though it's it's off the record. That still doesn't mean he's going to. Yeah, still. Yeah. 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 Go around. So. What's that, Jesse? Well, with well, in what James is talking about with Pete, it's just confidential. That's that's just medical information. With the Donda Academy, that's just Kanye West. Mm. That's that's what that is. Yeah, and even it's We're coming not back, even... guys. Hang on. Okay. Sorry. Good time to tell everybody to go subscribe to Corners of the Culture, available wherever you get podcasts from. Uh, We drop our first episode with me in the morning, me and Moore from KSFM 1025. Uh, We sat down and we talked about the the complexities of Kanye West. (laughs) That wasn't necessarily the intention, but the conversation really took off. It's supposed to be like a 10-minute thing about Kanye, and it 
ended up being 50. It was about an hour. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was a lot of fun, though. It was really interesting. Right. Um, when you wake up in the morning, it'll be waiting for you on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, uh, Odyssey, whatever your favorite podcast platform is. Uh, we've got some great episodes up right now, including album revisits of Ready to Die uh, in the corners of the coat and, and uh, the blueprint. And of course, we tell you about the birth of of hip hop in our debut episode of Corners of the Culture as well. And I, I gotta I gotta say, Damien, I'm, I, I gotta talk to you because I'm excited about this this next one that we're we're cooking up. Yeah, I the think we play it up. I think I think that's gonna be kind of fire. So it's just just a quick tech, just a quick check here, James. I believe I got my earliest text message. <laughs> In history <laughs> from Kenny Caraway this morning. And it wasn't to the show thread. It was just to me. And I thought, oh, man, Kenny must not be feeling well. like something's wrong. And I look at it and it's an idea for Corners of the Culture. So I knew I knew you hadn't filled me in. There was clearly something on your mind for you to text me like, for you that early in the morning. I think it's time. And we're okay. gonna, I think we have a bunch of these. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we could have like 50 of them over yeah. the course of the I had someone hit me up at seven o'clock this morning, like, "Hey, did you see the press release from the Kings that they signed um, <laughs> Kent Bazemore and uh, Quinn Cook at seven a.m.? They released yeah. that at seven o one, top um, of the morning." Yeah. yeah, I didn't, I didn't get up and actually screenshot it and send it out until nine because I thought that that was the proper time to send something like that out. Name's a little late to this. Sorry, but, uh... I'm late to the party. I don't um, care. <laughs> so I, 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 we, we, we frame that as I, I guess, uh, Quinn Cook and Kent Bazemore are here. <laughs> that, that's what, that's what the, that's what the contract signing and the press release means is that they're here in Sacramento. I guess they've been here though, so they just oh, hadn't hmm. officially signed, or maybe they did officially sign and the Kings just hadn't officially press released it. Mm -hmm. Um, at this point I'd have to go back, but I'm not even sure that I know who, what press release has been sent out and what hasn't been sent out. Um, but again, they're, they're making adjustments, they're figuring everything out on the back end, And, um, I'm going to give like the new media relations staff, uh, like a, a bit of time to get comfortable and get, uh, figure well, out what they're doing. Yeah. Because they're awesome. I just want to put that yeah. on record. Like they're 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 awesome but yeah go I, good people. My people over there go blue it's all my people over there <laughs> kenny kenny wow kenny's working to get us banned from everything right now <laughs> my goodness yeah. i was but, thinking 7 a.m i'm like is it mother's day is that what they're trying to do here like, <laughs> what's what going on is it today <laughs> father's day is it a holiday <laughs> but you know the, the thing that i think about we, we don't know exactly how it went down but you know james you had talked about you know, some of these guys, they just, they haven't signed because they haven't been here. And when they get here, they sign. Man, that, that's awesome. <laughs> like, to have $500,000 or $2 million, that's, I'll sign that contract. When, whenever I get out there, it's just, nah. If, if somebody offered me two mil, I'm walking there immediately. Yeah. Yeah, you're like door. ringing the doorbell, like ding, 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 ding. I'm here. I'm already here. <laughs> yeah, you know, two, two, two point five. Yeah, I'll be out in Sacramento like a month and a half. I'll sign it then. It's all good. Somebody offered Kenny two million dollars. He's not walking anywhere. No, I can I can assure you of that. My man is walking. No, two million. Cool. I'm gonna take the private jet from San Francisco to Sacramento. <laughs> spend about 500,000 of it just to get down yeah, there. That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I think those guys have been here. And again, I'll keep saying this. It really does feel like a lot of players have been here since like mm. late August. Um, some guys have been here a bunch all summer long. This is a good vibe. It's a, like a lot of guys are positive. They've been playing together. They've been, you know, building some chemistry and then when we get to like day five of training camp and you're the coach goes, yeah, you know, they're a little honorary with each other and they're, they're ready to go punch on someone else. So we can't wait for, uh, for the first preseason game. Like it's almost like I could script this thing. Like what's going to happen here in the next like 12 days. Um, once we start training camp and, and media day. I, I do want to point out this, this, cause I, I noticed it earlier and, and Stephen Brown has noticed it as well. And it is worth pointing out for those watching on Twitch, uh, YouTube and Twitter. 
James man. Ham is having I a. I was tripping. I was like, man, James is kind of clean with that hair today. He mm. is having a spectacular hair day today. <laughs> you know, I got my hair cut this morning, but you know, when you get done getting a haircut, the the hairstylist always like like puts gel on your hair and like does it. Mm-hmm. Like I can't do this, but yeah. Oh, um, it looks it, 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 as do that, Ham. As Steven says, it looks immaculate. Like it, you look like a soccer player. It's it's flawless. <laughs> yeah. It almost looks like you went to like South Natomas to get a cut. <laughs> like he was out there on Northgate or Norwood. Like it's it's on point like that. That's good stuff, Ham. All right. <laughs> Sam doesn't know what that means, but that's all right. That's all right, James. You look good, man. Media day is coming up. Ham's got to look sharp. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Plus, I needed like the five days of growth. When you know you you don't want to go in with like looking like you got your hair cut that morning. No. Uh, that's all right. That's yeah. all right. Yeah. And you know one thing that I this is different cultures, James. Different cultures, man. <laughs> <laughs> we often want to walk into places would, with everybody would, knowing we got the yeah, cut that I day. Came straight yeah. from the barber shop. <laughs> <Media day. laughs> there would have been some hair on my shoulder, like as I walked into the facility. <laughs> you know yeah. one thing that um I noticed because I was like yeah, just giving general looking at general numbers for actually it was for like this whole offense defense thing right like would you want a prime top flight score like at anthony edwards or would you want somebody that's imperative to the defensive end like barnes and, and mobley i was looking at that and i came across something that i just didn't realize very impressive Devonta sabonis was third in rebounding in the entire league last year mm-hmm. i didn't know he was that high i mean this is a guy that it's not out of the realm of possibility he can lead the league in rebounding this year. And that is, I know it's just one guy and it's going to take a team effort, but that is one way to improve the defense by getting somebody that will get you one shot and out. And that's something that, uh, well, I mean, I guess the Marcus, the Marcus was a, a, a big time rebounder here in Sacramento, but other than the Marcus have, have the Kings had a, a guy that rebounds at that clip um, in recent memory. You know, Oldham Polonies almost won the rebounding title as a member of the Sacramento Kings um, mm-hmm. many years ago. He came from Seattle in a trade. I think it was for Frank Brokowski, mm-hmm. and he was already tearing it up as a rebounder, and he had a big a big season. Um, as far as, like, rebounding overall, you know, Weber is a guy that always had good rebounding seasons. But, you know, outside of Cousins, I don't think so. I don't think that they've had – someone you know jason thompson was a solid rebounder but they haven't had somebody that's up in an upper tier mm-hmm. uh otis thorpe but years and years mm-hmm. ago uh yeah so uh, like it, it's a little uh it when i look at the defensive side of the ball i i do think it's so much more complex and just being you know better defensively a lot of it is things like rebounding a lot of it is things like having an efficient offense and making the other team pull the ball out of the basket like there's a lot to having a good, a good defense, um, stopping transition by not letting the other team get in transition by scoring the ball. Um, yeah. so yeah, I think that they have a, they have potential to be one of the better rebounding teams in the league. You know, Harrison Barnes averaged what 5.6 rebounds a game last season. Um, and you know, he's going to play a lot more three than, than he has in the past. And so you're looking at a guy like, uh, Keegan Murray, who, you know, I don't think he'll match his 8.7 rebounds per game from college, but I think he can average seven. I think he can average six and a half if he's playing, you know, huge minutes. And so if you start looking at all of these things around, um, you know, the court, I think that there are ways that this team can improve by just being more effective and efficient at the little things, little aspects of the game that actually mean a lot when you break them down. ESPN is in the process of releasing their top 100 players of 2022. Uh, and we noticed something yesterday or the day before, whenever we, we first looked at this list. I think it's still the top 10 that's, that hasn't been revealed yet. But um, De'Aaron Fox was 54. And it's fine, whatever. Like, we understand. That's 20 slots lower than he was last year. We understand, like, De'Aaron has something to prove, and that's fine. What I thought was more interesting was that DeMontis Sabonis was 47. And we've had the conversation in, 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 in that brief stretch of games that they were together, and even in some of our offseason conversations about 
who is the best player on the Sacramento Kings? Is it De'Aaron Fox or is it DeMontis Sabonis? And I think this is one of the first times that the, you know, quote, national media has weighed in. And according at least to ESPN's list, they think it's DeMontis Sabonis. Yeah, you know, first of all, I used to be part of of the voting for all of that uh, for a long time. Um, and so, like, I just think a lot of people don't watch a lot of West Coast basketball mm -hmm. and certainly not the Sacramento Kings. You know, they're not staying up late to watch the Kings back East. And so you're just not getting a good, like, feel for a lot of the players. They're not in all-star games. They're not in, you know, like a huge they're not being pushed on you by the league they're not in a bunch of uh you televised nationally televised games all that stuff so it, it's really tough to get a gauge on who these guys are for me i mean demontis sabonis is a two-time all-star and De'Aaron fox has never made an all-star team so that tends to tell me that that like on paper that sabonis is probably the best player uh but I, i'd also say that like it's situational like Fox has been in Sacramento playing in obscurity uh, for five years. And so what can he do? He, if he wants to take a personal and change the minds of everybody out there, he has a skill set to do it. He has the talent to do it. It's just whether or not he decides to put his foot down and do it. And I, we talked a little bit about it, um, you know, maybe a couple of weeks ago where, you know, Donovan Mitchell is now no longer in the Western Conference. Um, you know, there, how many, oh, DeJounte Murray. Uh, like you start looking at all the all-stars that have left the Western Conference for the Eastern Conference, and there should be like three openings. Now you're going to have to contend with, you know, a Kawhi Leonard or a Paul George and a Damian Lillard if they can stay healthy. Um, but, you know, I'd also say that like how many more times does Chris Paul make the all-star team? Because there was a, a window where he stopped making the all-star team. Um, so anyway, I, I think that there's opportunities here for, Fox to really put himself on the map and, and to get himself back in that conversation. But it's got to be day one. Day one, he has to play better. And he knows that uh, he's got to shoot the ball better. He's got to do everything a little bit better. And uh, and if he can do that, I, I think he'll be mentioned for playoffs. I mean, for a, for a uh, all-star bid if the Kings are competing at the all-star break. Um, like if they're in the... <laughs> it's 345 had like 10 minutes to go ham almost made it almost made it this had we've got to start we've got to we've got to start keeping track of this this is a this is this is this is a joe dimaggio like hitting streak right here this is spectacular hammer and it always ends the same way with ham Son unfreezing shaking his head uh <laughs> having no idea why yeah. everything just froze for the span of a couple yeah. seconds yeah i'm not sure it's... sorry guys no it's are you kidding i would have been disappointed if you didn't freeze at this point That's i can funny. wait till friday now now <laughs> we need to start taking prop bets on when ham will freeze it's usually really close to the four o'clock hour um i guess we are it must be that like a bunch of people get home and get on the internet like in my neighborhood at the same time um but yeah it's, Pull, it's they're, usually they're pulling james bandwidth here <laughs> they're yeah. sabotaging james bandwidth james uh, is the only one who doesn't find it funny too like we think it's fantastic I james does not find this funny whatsoever i don't know if it's accurate but this is hilarious benny has the last three times 343 354 <laughs> and now 345 i don't know if it's accurate but damn yeah it is that's it's amazing. It's very possible that's accurate. So um, it's also right around the time my 14-year-old gets home from high school and maybe he does something. Uh, I don't know. Uh, my 15-year-old, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what exactly happens there, but I apologize for all those people out there who see me freeze. No worries. Yeah. We love it. We lo I mean, we love hearing you talk too, but we, we love that as well. Um, but I, I did want to ask you this, and Damien, you can answer this question too. I think they have the Kings have four in the top 100 right now. It's Sabonis, Fox, uh, Harrison Barnes, and that Keegan. Is and Keegan. Yeah, Keegan Do at like 97, think, right? Yeah, that's right. Do you think they have anybody that can hop into the next one in the top 100 next year? Hmm. Yeah. Um, 
That's a good question. I mean, I, I certainly think that uh, that that Herder has is going to have an opportunity to jump up into that, um, but he's going to have to take a big leap. You know, he's going to have to shoot the ball more. He's going to have to be more forceful. And I know that everyone behind the scenes, like he's looking great. Um, they're super excited about him and all that stuff. But you know, he needs to he needs to average sixteen to eighteen points a game, and I think he can get there. Um, and then I, you know, again, I don't know what's going to happen with Harrison Barnes, but I would assume that, you know, he will either take a step backwards and, or won't be on the team and they'll have like one less player as well. So, mm. yeah. And, and, you know, maybe Davion takes a, a step, um, but that's the guy I was thinking. Yeah. It, it's not going to be super easy because he's always going to be playing behind somebody. So, you know, it doesn't matter like who you are as a player, if you're not an elite six man, a scoring six man, it's really going to be tough to break into that top 100 because a lot of guys just look at the the raw stats, the, you know, the points per game. This may be pie in the sky, and I guess I'm not that surprised, but I'm surprised there's no thought of Malik Monk. I think Malik- and no one's surprised that you said that. Hey, man, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you right now, man, Malik, what is he, he's 25 now, or he turning 25? 24. He's 24. He had, a, he had a really good year with the Lakers last year. He's probably one of their top, I mean, they weren't a good team, but one of their top. I hate how they diminish that, too. Oh, he had a really good year on that terrible Lakers team. Yeah, that's, that's what they do. Yeah, like, think, like, LeBron averaged 30 a game, too. Like, let's, like, yeah, the team stunk, but let's not, let's not diminish the individual players. I, I he played well, at least. I think of Malik in given the opportunity now maybe that's the thing I, him and Herter splitting time and, and or maybe Herter getting more or whatever he may not have the opportunity but if he is given the opportunity and his team is successful i could see i could see people looking at him like they looked at you know Lou Williams when, yeah. when he was in, in those spots and i think Lou Williams was looked at as you know and Jamal Crawford they were looked at as like top 100 guys when they were in their heyday, in their prime. So I, I could see that from Malik. Yeah. I mean, he has to take a, a pretty substantial leap statistically, and he's got to be able to, like, really find his role mm-hmm. um, as I, what I believe is going to be a six-man. Um, like, he needs to figure that one out and 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 excel in that role. Like, I, I've said this to you guys before. I think that they have, outside of Fox and Sabonis, I, I'd put Fox at, like, 23 to 25 points per game i think sabonis will be closer to 20 um but then how many guys do they have that can score 15 a game and it's four that's really good and and they could all be around 14 to 14 to 16 point range between keegan and harrison and uh malik and and kevin herter so yeah i I mean i think they they do have the potential to be a really really good scoring team and even uh davion mitchell has an outside shot like if he takes a a big step up and you know hits hits his three point shots with more consistency he could take Mm -hmm. a step so Mm -hmm. yeah they got a bunch of guys that can this should be a really solid scoring team figuring out everybody's role mike brown's toughest job Mm -hmm. because you got all those talent we, we, we believe you've got all those talented guys that you have to find a way to maximize it while making it fit. Yeah, I would say that as of right now, I think that it depends if he goes with a eight and a half, a nine man rotation, maybe a ten man rotation. I think the top eight are like written in stone, and so who's going to be that other guy that that steals some minutes? Is it Terrence Davis? Is it Trey Lyles? Is it Chima Moneki? I know people just like what like, but Shima Monkey could be that guy that they just fall in love with, with his energy and the fact that he can play multiple positions, like he can play the three and the four. Um, is it Metu? You know, like who is it that's going to step up and be that guy that, that plays a bunch of extra minutes? Kent Bazemore. Um, so, yeah, I really think that there is sort of like an eight man. So I would say that that's probably not his biggest uh, issue. His biggest issue is figuring out how to take the 27th best defensive team and make them a top 17 defensive team. That's going to be the hardest thing and and trying to figure out how to make this team play defense on a, you know, consistently every, each and every night. Yeah. 
Real quick before we get out of here, uh, Ham, any thoughts about Sarver? Um, looking to, looking to, are you surprised by that at all? Um, no. I think the best kind of regulation is self-regulation. Um, like a lot of times someone will say something stupid to me on Twitter uh, and as opposed to me freaking out and responding to them, I'll wait for like eight other people to say something to them. And, you know, uh, I, I think that the league dropped a hammer on him and made, uh, but it wasn't enough for a lot of us. And wasn't the, a big enough hammer. Yeah. The, the public outcry, but you have to remember that, that, you know, uh, Adam Silver works for the owners. That's mm-hmm. who he works for. Sure. Robert Sarver is one of his owners. So I think by, uh, you know, almost by intent, by being light on him, he allowed for the self-regulation to happen, for the outcry, the, you know, the, just the media and players and everyone else just jumping in and saying, no, 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 that's not enough. And I think that's showed Robert Sarver that like, look, you're not welcome back here. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, so I think this was mm. some next level Yoda stuff mm. by, uh, by Adam Silver. Adam Silver, um, right years ahead. Where, where he played uh, 3D chess, but he also, um, he had to do what was best for his owners, knowing that like some of the punishment that he would have liked to have dropped probably would not have been received well by some of the other owners because they don't want to be in that same situation. Right. And uh, so let's let the world regulate itself in this situation. And it did. Interesting. Next interesting, about, interesting, interesting. Light years ahead from Adam. Um, didn't sound like it when he was answering that question, though. Sure as hell didn't. <laughs> it did. It did. Sure as hell did not. But uh, <laughs> but have you ever seen him to be aw shucks? Because that's what he looked like in that in that moment. And Adam Silver never looks like. Wait, this is how it's being received. Like, yeah, mm, he never looks actor. stuck. He's a hell of an actor. Mm. The legend grows. There it is. He he just he just upped this street cred. Wow. Thanks, LeBron. It was that LeBron tweet that really, once again, <laughs> LeBron tweeting uh, has changed the face of the National Basketball Association, uh, as has James Ham. We Science. appreciate you so much for being with us today. Head over to the Kings Beat. Kingsbeat.com. Yo, Media Day starts Monday. Don't yeah. don't don't get left behind here. We got preseason games coming up. We've got practices. James Ham will be covering this team for ESPN 1320 uh, and for the Kings Beat on a daily basis. So make sure you're subscribing to 